World of Work, and I'm your host, Shep Cohen. Our guest today is Charles Chadwick, and he's a guy who loves work. He's a plumber, he's an author, he's a contractor, uh, he does security, plus a lot of other things. And he's written two very interesting books. If you're not sure about your child going to college due to a fear of high costs, loans, or aptitude, then you should stay tuned. Mr. Chadwick will explain that college is not for everyone, and maybe you should consider going into the trades, and we'll talk a lot about that this afternoon. Uh, so, Charles Chadwick, welcome to the world of work. Uh, I'm happy to have you on the air, and it's great that you uh, were able to make it. Uh, I guess you're in North Carolina now, and you came back for a family reunion? Yeah. Yeah, definitely came back from a family union, uh, left Hawaii, where I currently live and work in the construction security sector. But it's definitely good to be back where it all started in North Carolina. Now, I mentioned in my opening remarks uh, that uh, college isn't for everyone, but a lot of people don't want to admit that for status reasons or uh, you know, other reasons. Uh, and as a result, uh, some youngsters... Um, mainly boys are, are pushed into college um, when they're not ready for it and it's not for them, uh, when they could do other things like uh, become a plumber or an electrician and make a lot more money and be a lot happier. Tell us about exactly. uh, about uh, that predicament. Whew. I, I definitely can tell you about it because I've lived it. Um, it's no secret. My father had a plumbing business. I learned it while I was in high school helping him operating it, working with him. Uh, graduated from high school. I stuck with him an additional year after high school working. And one day, um, what a teacher told me in high school came into my back of my brain, you know, the unconscious side. Yep. If you don't go to college, you won't be successful. And that thought entered my head again. And even though, you know, I was making money I'm learning the trade, I'm, I'm, I'm running trucks, I'm picking up other workers from my dad business. I still feel left out, not from a conscious standpoint because you know skills can pay bills, I was making good money, but just because I had been programmed, in my opinion, in high school to go to college, go to college, you're, you're, you're gonna miss out on so much. You won't be successful unless you want go to college. So I grew up in that era where it's no secret in the United States, I can only speak from a United States standpoint, that while I was in high school several years ago, that was the agenda that was being pushed. I'm not saying it's bad and I'm not saying it was good, but we now know, especially after this pandemic, that college is just like a tool. But if you were to learn a trade, this is a lifetime learning skill. And I guess... The reason it is this way and nobody wants to admit it is uh, nobody has maybe have lived it. You know, I'm living it now. I have two college degrees. I pay back my loans. I'm now debt free. But what I found out is that I'm more successful with a set of skills that I learned for free. And that was plumbing in the trade industry for me. So it, I'm making it my mission now to speak out, you know, about it and tell people a different perspective with both sides in mind, college and trades. And the trades, uh, what, what do you mean by that? What, what is a trade exactly? Okay. In my opinion, a trade, I'll try to keep it simple here. A trade is just a learned skill that can fix or solve a, a problem. Typically, we could look at trade people as plumbers. Dealing with your residential, commercial, there's two areas, water and sewer. That's what you have. Either the toilet flush or it doesn't. Or when you go to your faucet to get a cold glass of water, if there's no pressure, that is the water supply. Um, the toilet represents the drain line. A plumber specializes in keeping those two, uh, those two areas functional. And if it's not functional, we have the skills to make it functional or completely design a better way of doing it. Uh, plumbers, electrical, electricians, HVAC, even roofers, sheet rocker, painters. I would even consider a person that do hardwood floors part of that skill 
trade industry, and that's what it is, a skill. Um, there is knowledge in it, learning a skill, but the difference, you know, from a degree and a skill, I would say is that the skill is real and the degree is more of a concept or philosophy of how something works. But with a skilled worker, they know we know how a system function and works. And how if someone graduates high school and decides uh, uh, he or she wants to go into a trade, how would they uh, go about doing that? Uh, Okay. Um, where I'm from in North Carolina, uh, I graduated from high school, let's see, in 2003, so almost 20 years ago. If there was an apprentice program in my state, it was not uh, promoted. Um, how I did it, I got in. I was just born into it. My dad had the plumbing business ready to go. But if I didn't have that, uh, I did notice when I was looking for uh, not even so much college, but tri I saw more apprentice curriculum programs up north, New York, New Jersey, places like that actually have a great apprentice curriculum. And it's no secret in the trade industry where you have that union, they will send you to school and there's more of a criteria. Where I'm at in North Carolina, there's no union. But what a person can do is just get hired with their local plumbing company and they're going to train you. You do not have to have any skills whatsoever. Uh, I would say it's fair to say you wouldn't even need a high school diploma unless that particular plumbing company wants that as their criteria. So where I'm from in North Carolina, if a person wanted to get in a trade, all they would need to do is get up with a licensed contractor, or maybe they don't have to be licensed, but if you want to do it right, I would say be up under somebody that's licensed, and they're probably going to have you on that job to work with a foreman, somebody who already has the skills. And if you like the trade industry, after X amount of documented hours and you got to show some pay stubs, you can go before the North Carolina licensing board and take your license. And if you pass the test, bada boom, bada bing, you got a license. How about uh, community, co community colleges? Do they offer courses for, in the trades? Yes, sir. And a matter of fact, when I was at my community college um, getting my associates in electronic servicing, I actually took plumbing fundamentals, electrical wiring fundamentals, blueprint reading. I also took uh, EPA refrigeration certification and lead and paint uh, renovation removal certification. So they did have some programs such as at the community college, you're going to be able to get so much. Sometimes they provide a certificate. Sometimes they have a diploma. And then sometimes they actually have a degree in that. It might not be specifically electrical wiring, but it will be something, as I did, electronic service and technology, for sure, community colleges. And again, I'm from the South, and I know for a fact from the various construction jobs that I've worked, where there's a union in that state or region, they have, that union has their own curriculum and certifiable program. But here in North Carolina, I could be wrong, but... All I remember is just if you want it to work, you could work there. We're not unionized yet, like pe like states up north. If you have a a plumbing problem that confronts you, and uh, you really never confronted it before, what do you do? Do you uh, how how do you get advice on uh, on how to solve that problem? Okay, in my case. Way back in the day when I was doing it with my dad, you know, when I was 15 or so, he was right there with me. And if he left me on a job site by myself, it's hard to explain things over the phone. So pretty much I was screwed. I would have to literally wait until he comes. And then I would learn right then and there. It's kind of like a math equation. I might have got the exponents right, the parentheses, but what to do next? Do I divide or multiply? My father would give me that new knowledge. And I would see it, receive the information why I needed to do what I needed to do to make it right. And that's one way. But in today's world, we have something that's free and it's YouTube. In the trade industry, you, you really, every day you're going to learn something new. And there's multiple pathways to fix or repair something. So I would say in today's society, if you're not with your foreman or the superintendent or supervisor, if you're really hungry, you could go on YouTube and we see master plumbers, master electricians giving good troubleshooting with the video 
an explanation on why maybe this circuit shorts out, why this receptacle shorts out or a plumbing. If you've done this, then try to unclog it from the house to the water meter. There's so many ways. But in my case, it was all OJT, on-the-job training. But in today's world, if a person doesn't have the years of level of experience, there are forums, there's YouTube, and you can always call your, again, the foreman or the supervisor on that job site and get the information. About 10 years ago, I interviewed a plumber, and he, he gave uh, an example of one day there was a problem which he just didn't know the answer to. And the, the person in, in, in the uh, home said to him, what are you doing about it? And he said, well, I have to think about it. And, uh, and he heard the homeowner on the phone like a minute after that with someone. He said, can you believe it? My plumber thinks. <laughs> what an attitude. Yeah, and, and that's some of the attitudes that you, you see here. And and this is that's an interesting point that you brought up because I'm coming into that realization now. The fact that I was in construction, plumbing more specifically, it caused me to develop critical thinking skills early on that I learned how to exactly what that plumber answer was. I'm thinking about it. Sometimes you literally had to stop and think. And this just doesn't apply to the trade industry. It applies to our everyday life. Sometimes when you hit that roadblock or you hit that your corners against the wall, sometimes the best thing that a person or individual can do is just stop and think. And you sometimes will get a clear answer that way by just stopping and thinking. And I've been there as well. Now, somebody who um, isn't, college material, but took college prep courses and was thinking of going to college, how would they know that they have an aptitude for some some trade, for working in the trades? I, I would say uh, to be a little bit comical right now and to be a comedian, I think many of us knew when we were sitting in that classroom and kind of like the Charlie Brown Snoopy show, you know, they say, wah, 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 If you're that person, whether you're male or female, and you're daydreaming, and you see yourself doing something else, I would say that's a great indicator that you might want to consider the trade. Because in the trade industry, there's not a lot of talking or receiving information. What it is, is your creation. You are literally creating, you're solving or resolving a problem, whether it's pipes, if it's electrical wiring, is it an open or short? It's, it's kind of like you in your own world when you're in the trade industry. So I would say, I think we, we knew. I knew that I didn't want to sit down the rest of my life, read books and listen to somebody else talk all day. Now that I think about it, I like to be active. I think if there was more activities in our high school where the teacher is trying to say, the reason you need college or geometry is to know how to lay floor tile down in the bathroom and that you keep them all square. They should have a real tile grout class there. And somebody, I guarantee you, they would show that they didn't need that math formula to lay the tile down. They could use their hands and their feet and their mind. So I would say at an early age, we all kind of know it, you know? And- Another factor to add in about college material, Yes, it's, it's no secret. We've heard this question before. Is college a business? And I, and I always heard people say no, but I have to come to the conclusion now that I lived it and I have two degrees and I'm looking at what's going on now in America with this student loan debt. I have to say, yes, it is a business to a certain degree. You know, they have these football stadiums here. The alumni is a part of it. It's kind of like, you know, like buying a vehicle. Do you want to drive the Mercedes style of the vehicle or would you want to drive, you know, a non big name? And I'm not going to talk bad about Ford. I love Ford, their American car. But if there was another brand that's not up there with Mercedes, you're kind of getting what you pay for. So when we say, do you know if college is for you or not? I say another question that a person, a parent, student must ask, where are you at financially? Do you want to invest, you know, $100,000 into college? Or would you might want to go to a trade that would be a way more fraction of that? I would even say to learn a trade is free because on your first day with no skills, that first day, you will get paid. 
you're just going to be watching the master electrician, the master plumber, handing him tools. He, he's going to train you. Hey, pass me a Phillips screwdriver. You hand him a, a flathead. He said, I don't need that. Don't you know the difference? And right then and there, an unskilled person is going to learn that knowledge on the job. So I would say two things with college. If you, you're in high school and you don't like a lot of talking, a lot of book work, hey, consider the trade industry. And also parents and students, depending on your finances, college is very expensive and it is a business. If, if you're willing to go in all that debt without any results, then I say be my guest. But those will be my two factors, you know your finances situation and do you want to sit down and and let somebody talk all day long or do you want to do the work and you be the creator how about uh, women in the trades um have you seen more women and uh how are they treated okay in my short time of experience i've seen and i'm not being sexist at all but i, I have to s- tell from my experience, what I've seen. I've seen a lot of general contractors, women have cleaning companies. When we finish the commercial building or residential Uh housing, you have the final walkthrough, the final clean through where they're washing the window seals, they're getting all those stuff. I've seen plenty of women do that. But they're not doing construction. No, but they're on those construction sites that need cleaning where I've done government contractors and they have contracting cleaning companies that come in and clean these government facilities. And even on the residential side, I know a general contractor, he had a cleaning crew where a lady had her own business service to do those final walkthroughs and cleanups before they CO a building to have it in. I've also seen women painters. Uh, I had a woman to repaint my house, but far as a plumber, I have never seen uh, a woman in my life physically, but there is a cool show called American Plumber Stories, and it's on YouTube, and I've seen women who own their own mechanical and plumbing company. So I've seen it on TV, but I have yet to see it in my eyes, except I was in uh, South Korea, and I saw women doing HVAC work, and that was amazing, too. I was mind-blown. They were insulating. They were putting the duct together. They hung, secured the duct, insulated, put the water-resistant ceiling on it. And I'd never seen that before in the United States. But I can't say in Korea, I did see women working in the HVAC field. But as far as here, like, I've never seen a female roofer. I haven't yet seen an electrician. And I haven't seen a plumber. And this is all from North Carolina and an overseas experience. But you're right, I haven't really seen that. And uh, while we're on this subject with the women in the trade industry, while I was researching, I found out women make up over 50 percent of the whole workforce in the United States. That That's a, a big percentage. Over 50 percent of our workforce in the United States is women. But when it comes to the skilled trade industry, the research showed that they're only representing 10 percent of the whole skilled trade labor industry even though women make up 50% of the whole workforce, they're only represented by 10% in the skilled trades. Hmm. Very, uh, very odd. Yes. Let me, let me ask you, um, people are always interested in this. Have you had, give give us some, uh, examples of, of, uh, encounters you've had with customers who are, not satisfied with something or other or want something else to be done more than what you've done already? This happens quite often. And I've seen it with my own eyes, you know, working right there with my dad. Uh, We've done some uh, beach house, waterfront homes, and, you know, that type of community, if it's homeowner association, the the people got big money and they're just, because they have the money, there's no limit to the project. So I'll never forget a story. Uh, it was a husband and wife. And the husband pulled us to the side and said, listen, I don't run nothing in this house. My wife runs everything. So whatever she wants, just go along with it. Please don't don't argue with her. And my dad, we looked at it as a challenge to provide the best customer service we could. Uh-huh. And it started out with us ripping out a bathtub moving a toilet over to another location in the bathroom, 
getting all that stuff done, what we originally planned only to when it was all done and said, the lady, I'll never forget it. She was just shaking her head like this, said, guys, I thought that's what I wanted, but that's not what I wanted. And because we were made aware of it by our husband, my dad, we just smiled and said, you know what? This is your house and we're here to please you. And honestly, we are. We're here to serve the customer. Tell me how you want it. So we ripped everything out. And when you work in a trade, I, I can tell you some funny stories. That alone, when a towel guy has put his last towel for a nice uh, walk-in shower with the body sprays only for the homeowner to come in and say, you know what, that towel looked a lot brighter, but now with the light, I don't like it. Can you take it down? I literally saw a towel guy pack all his, when the customer left, he threw that towel on the floor. He packed up his tools and said, I'll come back another day for this job. Yeah. So I would say in the trade industry, uh, to please the customer, that's what we live for. And sometimes you have the customer that uh, the saying is the customer is always right. And if they got millions of dollars, guess what? They can change their mind a million times and, if you're a good tradesman, you're going to keep making all those changes and, and, and build them. And getting you know? paid for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about the uh, the time you were involved with an, un an ungalvanized pipe? Oh, yeah, man. Uh, I learned quickly uh, working with my dad again. I, I learned so much. I give all the credit to him. But the interesting thing with plumber is galvanized is in a lot of older homes, at least I can say for North Carolina, as the main water supply line. The galvanized is fine as long as the water doesn't get to it and oxidate. So when you're underneath a house or crawl space and that galvanized main supply line is buried in the ground and coming up, sometimes that causes a lot of corrosion. And I learned very quickly years ago, a customer had a pinhole leak. And my dad said, watch this, son, you're going to learn on these older plumbing systems when you fix one leak and you cut that water pressure back on the house, it's going to go to the next weakest point. Mm. And in one day, we spent a good proportion of the day fixing patch after patch after patch after patch because the customer um, didn't have the budget to put in a new pipe water supply system, a whole new water line. The whole house needed to be redone. It needed to be gutted. But because they were on a budget and we were already underneath the house, we was already dirty, uh, my dad said, son, sometimes you got to please the customer, even if you know that, you know, the, the real better solution would have been to replace the whole water supply system underneath that house. But that was an interesting day for me to learn how to love plumbing, <laughs> how to love plumbing and serve the customer. Well, you, you, you're very enthusiastic about the plumbing work that you've done and, and are doing. Um, what is it that makes you so enthusiastic and, and apparently to enjoy plumbing so much? Okay. I didn't enjoy it at first because uh, I'm wired a little bit different. My father has really taught me patience because it's like this. Uh, when you're in construction, you, you could have a million fittings or the parts that you think you're going to need on your van, your service truck. But it's always the one part that you didn't think you need is the one you need later on as you're in the middle of a project. So with me, I looked at plumbing. I slowly come to enjoy it with patience because I love fixing things. I love solving things. I love troubleshooting things. And to me, that's one of the fun parts about learning a trade. Each day is going to be totally different. And just because you fixed uh, an issue a certain way that one time does not mean that the second time you go there, you're going to be able to apply that same method. So with me, uh, I look at plumbing. It's not checkers. It's like chess. There's so many different ways that you can do many things. You can transition from a copper pipe and transition to the new PEX. You can go from PVC to copper. There's so many ways you can go to it. You can add on an older house with old cast iron pipes. If there's tree roots, we can cut that section of the cast iron pipe out, add two firm coats, and put the new standard PVC in there and be done. So with me, I'm a thinker, and I love to solve problems. So at first, I couldn't stand plumbing, but my dad really showed me patience. He showed me how to enjoy those days where, you know, you're in the middle of nowhere, and Lowe's is 45 minutes away, and you got to go back to Lowe's to get the one part that you didn't think you'll need, you know, because... 
when a customer calls us, we try to get the most information. Hey, sir, do you got copper lines? Yeah, 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 they're copper. Can you send me a picture? And then it was a copper line, but it was only like 12 inches. The rest of the house was galvanized. So by the time we get there, you know, something as a water leak repair turns into a whole water supply, new installation replacing it job. So that's what I, I really enjoyed about it. And I'm enthusiastic about it. And as my dad always taught me, he said, son, sometimes the job that you think is going to be hard really is going to be turn out to be easy. And the job that you thought you were going to that was easy is really going to turn out to be hard. A plumber I, I've dealt with over the years uh, said that stuffed toilets is his, his biggest his most frequent uh, call or most frequent problem that uh, he encounters when he's called by a customer. I, I would say that too, man, especially if there are some children involved, some little kids, because they love to flush the, the big dial bar soap or the transformer action figure down there or even a toothbrush. And I, I can tell you a funny story if we got time. We, yeah, went, we, to a, we went to a commercial bar one time. Uh, this bar, of course, served the wings and the alcohol. And another plumber was there that day, and he gave up on the job. We got called, and what it was, it was a toilet that couldn't flush. So we went down. There's a tool called a snake. Uh, yes. you got to use it very delicately so you don't scar the toilet up. It has a little rubber U-shape, and then you have a wire, and it has like a little prong on it, like a wire that it'll grab it. So we put the snake down. And, you know, my dad, we're turning it. He said, hey, come hold the base of it. This is a tough one. So we're turning it, turning it. And before you know, the whole snake popped. I've never seen that before where the actual wire is about one inch and has the coil and the little prong on it. It popped. He said, out of all my years of doing plumbing, I've never seen this happen before. He said, go get the second one off the truck. We're doing it. We're doing it. That one popped. He said, you know what, let's take this toilet up and see what in the world is going on. He has never seen where a snake has broke, you know. So we pulled the toilet up, and okay. what we found was a two-by-four triangular door stopper in the uh. toilet with about 20 wings. So I don't know <laughs> if a customer got really drunk that night, but he put the door stopper from the bathroom in the toilet, flushed it down, and there was 20 wings inside of the toilet. I've never seen nothing like that before. But that is one of the most funniest story that I can remember uh, troubleshooting something. We've never had a snake, which, again, is a wire tool. You put it down the toilet and you can wring it out to, to break through the cloth. But I've never seen two pop like that. And I haven't had another one to pop on me. So from that scenario now, if I ever had where the snake ain't going, I don't even waste time. You go ahead and pull that toilet up, break the seal with the wax ring, see if it's a toy or an our case at a local nightclub bar, 20 chicken wings, clear that out, put a new wax ring down. If the John bolts are rusted, put new John bolts and set the toilet down and go on to your next service call. So that's what I kind of like about plumbing. When you learn those little funny moments like that, it gives you a new insight to how if that problem exists again, why waste time with a snake? Go ahead and pull the toilet on there if there's a clog. Well, Charles, Chad, join the tradition. And we're back on the air. This is The World of Jeff Cohen. And we're speaking with Charles Chadwick, who is a plumber. Uh, he's also an author. Uh, he's a contractor. Uh, and we're talking a lot about what it's like to work and as a plumber. Um, also, you work in Hawaii now, isn't that correct, uh, For as a uh, security contractor? Yes, sir, the construction security sector. I know you can't get into many details, but uh, let us know, uh, you know what that is and how, how you uh, were able to get a job in that, in that area. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely tell you about it. It's, it's a very, very interesting story. Um, the, the quote, the jack of all trades and a master none, that's me, but when it comes to careers, because I'm so motivated to learn. So uh, my father retired as a, a law enforcement officer and after college, and again, this brings back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, I majored in communications. Believe it or not, I actually wanted to be like a news anchor or, or work behind the camera. After graduating, applying to every news station that I knew of in Iowa, South Dakota, I was desperate. 
after not getting no hits, I said, you know what? I'm going to pack everything up and I'm going to head back home and jump right back into plumbing with my dad. What I ended up doing is joining the sheriff's department where my dad retired from. So I have a law enforcement background as well. Um, I started out at a state prison and then I transferred to the local jail and then I end up becoming a deputy on the road. Well, the interesting thing about the deputy sheriff position, that gave me a life experience that I could add to my resume. And I had a cousin who was overseas contracting and he kept t begging me to give up my job and go overseas and make some decent money. So a lot of times on these contracts that I work, they like prior military. They also like for you to already have a clearance. Me, I'm just a regular civilian police officer, but because of that credential that I got certified from the state of North Carolina Sheriff Association, I was able to go overseas and work as an armed guard. And I worked that job and I built my resume up and all of a sudden, I saw a position that said construction security. Since I was already in armed security, I was really thinking, am I going to be armed? Am I going to be doing something? But when I really looked into the job uh, description, it was more about construction security. And it's kind of interesting if you're a parent or a student listening now, like every career move that you do, it's going to, in my opinion, help you in some way. You're going to learn that lesson. So by me being a deputy sheriff, but also, as I stated in the beginning, getting all those construction certs and continuing ed classes, it qualified me to get sponsored for a high clearance. And I was able to get that construction security job, even though I didn't meet the qualifications as far as with the clearance. But once they saw that, hey, this guy got, you know, armed security, law enforcement background, he has plumbing background, he has some certification, he took electrical wine, blueprint reading. All that did was make me that more attractable to a certain employer. And they went ahead and hired me without me even having a clearance. And they they sponsored me a clearance. And anybody who's in the contracting world or people who are in the military, you know how big of a deal that is to have a company sponsor you a clearance. So that's how I got into that job. Now you they were building really, your resume then all along. Yep. Did you and, and did that, you knew that did you do that intentionally or was that no. something? No, no, not at all. I, again, I'm a, a country guy from North Carolina. And one good nugget that my community that raised me always taught me was if you work hard, you know, eventually something's going to give. So I always know the importance. And, and this is might sound far fetched because we're in the great resignation <laughs> era. Yes. But when I grew up, I was taught you give that two weeks notice no matter what, even if you win the lottery. Give the two weeks to your employer because you never know. You may have to come back. So when we talk about resume building, that's exactly what I did. I thank every company that's ever given me an opportunity. I always leave on a good note in case I have to go back. But, yes, sir, I, I did not do that intentionally. It's just like my life transpired. While overseas and around different people, they began to tell me, Charles, you're in this sector, but if you would just use this then you can get out of armed security and make more money and do something else. So it's like anything else. If you're a young listener or parents, even just starting out as a fast food restaurant, I started out at Church's Chicken. I learned so much networking, but that is how I got that job. It's like everything that I had did in the past built some forward momentum to allow me to keep adding on. And even to this day, um, I work overseas sometimes. And when I come home, I look at my community college brochure if there is a welding course that possibly could be available at the time I'm on home for vacation leave, I would sign up for it and do it. And that's what I've always done. I've always utilized my time. And even a quick tip uh, from my uh, college checklist book, in the summertime, a lot of kids go home, they party, they don't work. But what I did, I kept going back to my community college and taking more electives and transferring them back to my university. So I would say always build that resume up because it does add up in the end. You might not see it when you're young, but it really helps you out later down the road. And you talked about networking. Um, talk about that a little more, how important it is and how someone should go about networking. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Um, networking. If I could describe it, we all have networks at our house, you know, on these modems and ITs. And look how the internet is connecting us right here in this moment. I'm in North Carolina, and I believe, you know, you're up North. New Jersey. We're in Jersey. Okay, Jersey. 
we're networking right now because of the internet. And I think sometimes to get back, and I am here to talk about both sides, college and trades. I, I feel like some people in college, if they've never worked that fast food job and they have no skills whatsoever, sometimes it can be deceiving to think that the degree was all what you needed. But the degree is just a fraction. You need to network. If one of your friends in college, you're going to school to be an attorney and his dad has an attorney firm, ask him to do an internship. It's all about networking. The degree alone is not going to, you know, get you to the top. You're still going to have to go through people. We have a lot of technology today, but you still have to go through people. Um, that is what my life has been, networking with other people. And to be honest, when I finish a contract, I typically go home and don't work for 90 days, sometimes six months, Why not? and just relax. And what happened is a friend that I met on another contract, hey, Charles, man, what are you doing now? Oh, I spent two years in Europe. I'm home now. Hey, this new company is hiring. You don't have to fill out the application. Do you want to work it? I always say, what's the hours? What's the pay? What's the location? Uh, can I take annual leave there? And if they like, cool. I've gotten jobs where I didn't even have to apply through the application. My resume and somebody else's word got me to the PM of that site, and he said, welcome aboard, just like that. So I think with the young people, degrees are cool, but you, you, you're going to have to do some networking, and networking is the key thing to anything in life. You know, We're all a community. The degree is just a partial, small piece of what you're going to be doing in your life. There's so much importance of networking. And if I could add one little note, as I'm sitting here thinking in the trade industry, there is a lot of networking going on because you have the general contractor, you have his subcontractors up under him, and then you could have the client or the customer. The one thing that I learned working with my dad in that plumbing business was networking. Because when we're under a crawl space or even doing a slab house, we want to make sure our pipes is in the wall. We want to make sure that we're at code for us, the center of the drain line. What gets in our way sometimes could be an electrical receptacle. Uh, a HVAC duct product vent could be right in the middle of where our pipes go. Therefore, we have to network with the electricians and the HVAC guys of that site and even the framers and say, hey, we got a pipe here. The code says this. Is there any way you can go around it? If not, we're going to have to ask the GC and explain this to them and go to the customer and ask, is it okay? The pipe is supposed to be 12 inches here, but because you got this special electrical fixture going here, we're going to have to move it 12 inches over. To me, that sums up what networking is, getting what you need to get done and then along the way communicating for somebody that can affect how you get something done. So I, I want to include that, too. In the trade industry, you're networking all the time between the multiple trades. The electrician has to know the plumber. He has to know. He doesn't have to know how plumbing works, but he has to meet and greet that plumber because you're going to be working together no different with the HVAC and even sometimes the framer and even the sheetrock guy. Uh, another quick example, when you deal with tile and showers and that sheetrock, and I hopefully they're not using sheetrock these days, it's called dirt rock, which is more tougher. It's also waterproof, you know. Sometimes when we do those nice body sprays and shower valves, we got to know it down to a science because what's the finished tile? If the finished tile is one inch and the code calls for the valve to stick out two inches, we got to know that. So that's why we communicate with the towel guy, the sheetrock guy, to make sure they're firing that wall so that we can get the finished grade. So when that discussion cover, covers go on, you know, it's good to go and there's no more tearing out walls. And that's what I call networking. When you were dealing with your father, did he treat you like a, a worker or, or his son? Did you call him dad? Did you call him by his first name? Uh, how did that work when you were working together? Now, I, I started little now. So, you know, as most young people, you, you don't want to listen to your parents and at the time, I thought my dad was hard on me, but honestly, he wasn't. It's, it's the best thing that could have happened. He, he treated me as if I really was a worker in many things. I wouldn't even say it was like a, it was a son treatment, but here's something you don't hear people talk about too much, the baby boomer generation. That's what era my dad age group is. And when he came along, there was no talking back. You do is what you're told. 
my generation, I'm kind of born in the 80s. We started to mouth off a little bit. And in my father's time, he would feel insulted. You said, if I would have said that to my father or my boss, I would have got fired on the spot. So I think here in America, in this country, we're seeing where the young people are not afraid to maybe mouth off or talk back to leadership. Um, my dad, I would say he treated me like a son. And at the time, I thought he was hard on me. But all he was doing was preparing me for the real world. Uh, something as simple when I ran my first set of water lines, he would say, come here, look at this. And I would look, say, what's wrong with them? He said, they're crooked. Run straight pipe lines. You always want your work to look good. And it kind of got to like a little competition where I know that he's looking for something that's wrong. So I tried to go to hell and back to make sure that I didn't do anything wrong. But a good father is always going to find something wrong with that son to let him know that you're not going to get out of it easy. You always got to be on your A game. So that's what my father relationship was for me at the time. I didn't understand it, but I'm so thankful that he taught me hard work and the importance of getting up in the morning. He taught me that sometimes, you know, it's going to be tough, but, you know, you got to be held accountable for it. And I, and I appreciate that tough love that may be missing and some parents uh, these days is that tough love. How did you survive the pandemic? Um, I can honestly say I, I feel like I survived the pandemic uh, by being in the field of construction. Um, I really self-reflected as I saw people losing their jobs. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I've never seen a time where the world shut down. Maybe one country could have shut down, but as it spread, you know, it shut the whole world down. So I survived off uh, construction, working in the sector I worked in. In America? Yep. I, mean, I was in America uh, at the time of the uh, pandemic. But even I, I have friends that's in the same field and they're overseas now and they work through it because I feel like with construction, it's no secret. Electrical, plumbing, HVAC, roofing, uh, sheetrock, concrete workers, brick masons, they tip, we typically survive harsh economical times because of the need of the work. You know, this pandemic, it stopped a lot of things, but it didn't stop people toilets from running over. It didn't stop That's electrical right. receptacles from tripping to breakers or breakers burning out. It didn't stop uh, a furnace or a split unit from needing repairs. Life goes on. And I'll tell you something else I learned from another podcast I was on. Gas prices is not going to stop you from calling a plumber if you don't know how to fix your own stuff. So plumbers, electricians, HVAC, roofers, all these trade skill sets are kind of, I don't want to say it's bulletproof, but I, I have to say maybe it is, you know, because this pandemic really, if this pandemic didn't show everybody whether or not your job is important or not, or the skill set in the field you're in, I don't know what else can. But yes, that's how I survived the pandemic. I still had income coming in. Nothing did not stop. I thought I was going to get sent home, but I didn't. You, I was deemed like a, a magic wand. Boop, you're essential. Come to work. <laughs> you're not staying home. And that's what I was told, and I came and worked through it. And even I talked to my dad, you know, during this pandemic, I really wondered, you know, the psychology of how we live our lives. You work, you make money, and then you want to spend that money. But with all the people that were sitting home, I bet, some people, I don't have no data. This is just a thought. Did a lot of people remodel during this time? Did a lot of people look at that? Oh, I don't like my wall. I want to paint them because you're sitting inside your house this whole time. And instead of buying what you buy or whatever, your toys, I, I wonder, did a lot of people reinvest that money in, back into their house with remodeling? My dad said he was busier than ever during the pandemic with service calls and remodels. I guess they did. Or if uh, some people wouldn't want anyone in their house during the yeah. pandemic, so they didn't remodel. But um, you also have written two books. What 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 area are they in, and um, what what uh, motivated you to write a book? Okay, uh, it's in a, the two books are exactly what we've been talking about, and I think this is a conversation in America that we need to have as a nation. It needs to be in every high school college or trades that's what these two books are and i'm not knocking either one i'm not saying don't do college and i'm not saying do the trade or do the college but don't do the trade what i'm saying is look at both 
I really do believe, and I'm a man of quote, I made this quote up, maybe somebody else made it up before me. But right now, as we want to build back a better America, we're not going to do it with just degrees alone. We are going to have to get some young people, women, minorities, and everybody we can in the trade industry. It's always been the backbone. So the first book I published, and I published these books both during the pandemic in two years. I published uh, Chadwick's College Checklist in year 2021. Uh, that was featured in the Advisor Perspective website, which is a financial advising website. And all I did was tell the truth. If you start out at a community college, you're going to save 50%. You're not going to pay that room and board fee. You're not. You're going to avoid the meal plan. And you're just going to cut costs. Why are people taking out all these loans when you can go to a community college and possibly get the same? Um, I also talk about how I stayed on campus for free. I also talk about how I saw a staff member of the college university I went to son get a degree for free, and it was probably worth thousands of dollars. So I explain a lot of secrets in that book, and it's not a book about saving money. I clearly say, great, if you got a scholarship, if you got a grant, or your parents did a 529 savings plan, great. But my book is what you want to read after you get your financial away financial aid award package and all i'm doing is showing people how to cut costs and not save money um, the best example i give in the book about that is when we go to lowe's there might be a washing machine that you want and they say it's on sale quote unquote it was originally four hundred dollars and now we're going to sell it to you for three hundred the average person to say hey i saved a hundred dollars but in my book, I break it down. You didn't save $100. What you did was you cut your cost. Because unless you can put that extra $100 you didn't pay in your bank account, you did not save. But what you did do was cut your cost. And that's what I'm teaching in my college checklist book. It's just two steps with tips. And I'm showing people how to cut costs. And it's documented. I'm not telling you. I'm showing you what areas that you can eliminate. And I cut my college costs by 40%. My bachelor's degree should have cost me 31000 plus. But because I knew how to cut my costs, I got it down to 18000 And my quick philosophy to sum it up when it comes to college, just when it comes to college, buying a car or a house or anything you want to buy, just because somebody put a sheet of paper in front of you with a number on it does not mean you always have to pay that full price for it. Learn to cut costs. Um, the second book is called Chadwick Cultivated Circumstances, Experiences, Sometimes Prices. This was featured in the Reader's Digest this year alone. And all I'm doing, I reflected off my life experience, what we were talking about in the resume. Um, I talk about what plum has been to me and how experience is free. You don't have to pay for experience. You might have to put the effort to get up and go sit beside an electrician or sit beside a plumber. You might have to have the effort to buy your own study guide book to learn it, but experience is free. And the theme of that book is definitely tied to COVID, but it's a booster. You know, if you had to reset and you're having to get back in the workforce, now is the best time. I know it might sound crazy, but this is why I say in my opinion, now is the best time. So many businesses and companies want people to come back to work. And you know what they're willing to do? They're willing to give up the prerequisition requirements that they used to want us to have before this pandemic. I'm reading and seeing companies doing away with degrees requirement. We'll bring you in. As um, far as years of experience, we'll, we'll do away with it. Just come in and work. So now is the best time, in my opinion, to go for that dream job because... The, the requirements are almost out the door for some jobs. Now, if you're going to be a doctor and a brain surgeon, sure, you're going to need that degree. But for some minor other little jobs, I'm seeing companies give sign-on bonuses and the requirements are being away. But that's what I talk about in that book right there. I also talk about, in the conclusion part, I want people to really think. Experience is free. I learned to fix cars. I've learned plumbing. I've learned so many things, but by no means am I saying I'm an expert or I'm licensed or certified. Licensed or certified means that you had to pay some money. 
you had to pay for a state exam. You might have to pay your union dues to keep those certifications. But if a person really just want the experience, in my opinion, it's free. All you have to do is wake up and sit beside that plumber or electrician or HVAC. If you're a parent, it, sign your kids up for an internship, put them with a plumbing company and say, hey, you don't have to pay them. Let them work that summer. And I and I, and I know that if a, ch- a child is exposed to that, eventually he's going to start learning what he likes and don't likes. And in return for a parent, you could be saving thousands of dollars because your child will say, you know what? I don't want to go to college right now. I want to stick with this trade for the moment. And if they want to go back to college, guess what? They're going to have that skill to finance it. And a lot of people don't know this, but plumbing has helped me to repay back my student loans when I did. And go to a community college. Uh, if you yes, go sir. to a con- community college and you do well there, uh, how, how likely is it that you'll be able to get into a four-year college? I think it'll be highly likely, um, depending on, you know, your GPA. Uh, sometimes the SAT is uh, not needed at a university, depending on where you go if you have that community college. And here's the secret. Nine out of ten times, I've seen it with my own eyes, those trans- those credits that you earn at the community college that were cheaper, the, the same ones at the university that would have charged you triple price for, let me see, uh, introduction to computer or CIS 110 computers, maybe at the community college, it was $200. At the college, they're going to charge you $1,000 for CIS 110, which is basically like an introduction to computer Excel. Yes, though that same credit will transfer to the university nine out of 10 times. Sometimes they won't, but if you check like I did beforehand, I was getting those electives knocked out knocked out even at the university my first two years in the summertime i didn't go home and play i went back to that community college and got into more electives and transferred them back to the university and i got my bachelor's quicker i graduated early because of that well charles chadwick we have about a minute and a half left Uh, any closing thoughts um like for example who's who's the audience for your book and uh any oh yeah um, my audience is for America first because I've traveled internationally and I'm here to tell you with what I've seen internationally, I saw something that was true and it's always true. Economics are international. These are other people in these other countries. They're hungry. They're speaking fluent English. They're learning degree things and they're also learning trade things. So if you're a parent or you're a student and you don't know what to do, examine both of these books and I'm giving you both perspectives and again, don't just stop with a degree, get into the trade industry. If anybody want to learn more about me, they can go to my website. That's www.chadwicks, C-H-A-D-W-I-C-K-S, and then the word experience with a S, chadwicksexperience.com. And if you want to see what I have on social media, I'm always posting things about how to cut student loan debt. I'm making it my mission. I'm tired of seeing millions of Americans carrying massive student loan debt. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Reduce College Debt. I came up with that catchy follow me at sign to let people know that I'm a man on a mission. Follow me at Reduce College Debt, Facebook or Instagram. And, you know, the future is bright. I had positive people telling me that my future was bright. I know with the news and the media, sometimes they're talking about this student loan. Yeah, five seconds. Yeah. Do it. The future is bright for parents and students. Thank you. Okay, Charles Chadwick, thank you for being with us. It's been a pleasure speaking with you on the World of Work this afternoon. And we're ending and coming up next is Gene with Anything Goes. Until next week, this is the World of Work, and I'm your host, Shep Cohen.